being aggressive. Hello! Hello! <laughs> um, welcome to yet another installment of Minds, Technology, and Society with gracious funding from the Glushko and Samuelson Foundations. Uh, today, our speaker is Joe Brewer, uh, who I'm really excited to introduce. Joe was, uh, as he's told me, born and raised on a chicken farm in Missouri. <laughs> He has, uh, uh, did his undergrad in physics and a bachelor's in atmospheric science, then had a, a whirlwind of will-o'-the-wisp type career. He spent some time as a research fellow at the Rockridge Institute working with George Lakoff. Um, he is, I think, most notably a, uh, was it, involved in uh, the Evolution Institute's This View of Life magazine. Uh, was a founding member of the Cultural Evolution Society and recently uh, the founder and the executive director of the Center for Applied Cultural Evolution uh, and which he'll talk to us about today. So uh, please welcome Joe Brewer. So hello everyone. Uh, really excited to be here and talk with you today. And. Uh, I think part of the reason that Paul was like, I'm not quite sure how to describe Joe, I've got to just pick a couple of things, mm -hmm. is because um, I'm one of those people who really tries to get a holistic understanding of things, and to do that you have to meander a lot through life, which I've definitely done quite a bit of. And what I want to share with you today is something that's become a really big passion for me, which if I were to be shorthand about it would be a how do we save the humans in our complex planetary scale civilization? Which, uh, for all of its ills, I rather kind of like and want to keep around. And so, um, and I don't really mean that in jest. So, uh, so it's something I've been taking seriously for quite some time. And I wanted to start off by uh, explaining why I put this picture up here, which is that I feel like we don't really have the ability to grapple with really complicated, thorny, and sometimes painful things, unless we can step back from them and get a little bit of a, a more distant view. And then things start to come into clarity, and pieces that seem separate from each other can just kind of fit into something that's a holistic picture. And I think it's going to be really important for us to do that. So today I'm going to do more of a sweeping overview than a really detailed discussion. So it won't be like your typical research talk that goes into the details of a particular study or a body of research, but rather looking at what we can do with many different kinds of research to begin to tackle a variety of problems that currently are unaddressed. So, with that said, let's get started. This is the simplest way that I could name the cultural evolution problem that humanity is dealing with right now, which is that if we look at the macro scale pattern of humanity, as depicted by our growth in population, we'll see that we are having catastrophic cascading consequences across the biosphere of the entire planet. A simple way of measuring that is with extinction of species. And so, one thing that this graph captures in such a simple and elegant way is that there's no real separation between this massive human experiment and what's happening to the rest of the planet. And so without going into the details of climate change and soil degradation and the dead zones at the floodwaters of rivers and so on. I can make this big litany of, of things and make an entire talk and really depress the shit out of all of us. I just wanted to say that we are in a moment of transformational crisis as a planet and we are the instigators. And so it is up to us to understand how we became such powerful actors on the world stage and what we might be able to do to address it at the scales and the urgency that is needed. So with that said, I want you to just reflect for a moment on what it means to look at a cityscape like this and how much goes into building an elaborate urban structure like the city of London, where you have skyscrapers and millions of people going about their daily lives, huge amounts of infrastructure built in here. And to be able to create something like this, you have to have things like this much, much larger land areas transformed through human management to achieve goals like food production. So our urban centers are just a tiny piece of a much larger footprint. And there's a deep interconnection between local places and broad swaths to distant locations of interconnections between people and landscapes. 
And that's why we are currently watching the warming of the Arctic and the Antarctic and the mountain peaks where the glaciers are all around the world with global warming, which is an indicator of what happens when this massive thrust of human activity begins to offset the dynamics of the entire planet. And if you haven't studied much climate science, I've got to tell you, that's a hell of a lot of thermal inertia that we're talking about. So basic point number one, for us to deal with these really big problems that we're dealing with in the 21st century, we need to work together. We need to get really good at working together. And we need to do it at unprecedented scales that we've never managed to succeed at doing before. And if you look around outside in the world today, you'd probably notice we're not really doing that great of a job. So one of the questions will be, is it even possible for us to co collaborate on the scales necessary to deal with something like planetary disruption of the biosphere? And I want to start this in a little bit of a provocative way by making it difficult. So these graphs are from data uh, prepared in 2010 where there are five bars on this graph, each of them representing 20% of global humanity. And they're showing you what the distribution of wealth is in the world, where basically the top 20% controlled about 90% of the world's wealth. At that time, the bottom half billion, or three billion people, half human population, their aggregate wealth was the equivalent of that, of about 300 people. Now why does this matter? Because there's a huge body of research showing that when societies are really unequal, we're really bad at cooperating. It undermines cooperation through a variety of mechanisms. And oh, by the way, that was 2010. Now that number is down to eight. So now there are eight people who have the same aggregate wealth as 3.5 billion people. So this is a problem that's not getting better. It's getting worse. So there's this question, can we cooperate on large scales when we have such inequality that's making it difficult for us to do so. And with the kind of silver lining on the thunderstorm sort of thinking, check this out. According to the Global Tax Justice Network, in 2010, about $21 trillion, actually is estimated between $21 and $34 trillion globally are hidden away in tax havens. So why are so many of us poor? It's because there's a vast global network for pulling out and extracting massive amounts of money and hiding it in the coffers of a tiny number of people. According to Oxfam in January of this year, 82% of new wealth created, measured in GDP, went to the top 1%, while the bottom 50% had zero gains. So this is a global systemic pattern of wealth hoarding. The thing I want to say is that this didn't happen by accident. This massive hoarding of wealth it was not something like, oh, this is just what all economic systems necessarily do. It was by design. It was something that was done intentionally. And we can trace its origins, or at least a key part of its origins, to two dates. One is 1947, when a gathering of people met in Mont Pelerin, uh, Switzerland, to form the Mont Pelerin Society. And neoclassical, or neoliberal economics was born. A group of people got together to promote free market ideology. They were pretty unsuccessful for a few decades, up until 1971, when the famous Powell Memo was written, which offered a strategy for wealthy businessmen and their, uh, their laissez-faire economic collaborators to establish a cooperative framework, a strategy that they could use to build a network of think tanks, consolidate media, pay for endowed faculty positions at universities, especially in business schools and economics departments, and to gradually shape the policy landscape to create a regulatory environment conducive to them. What this did was it enabled the largest hoarding of wealth in the history of humanity, all in the span of a few decades. My point here is that large-scale cooperation is possible, and it's currently being done by a subset of the human population for a very specific goal, which is to make themselves as wealthy and powerful as possible. I don't share this with you to give you a kind of conspiracy theory story. All of this is well documented and thoroughly studied stuff. My point is this, that we have a proof of concept. Is it possible for there to be a large scale social change of entire social systems at a planetary scale 
to achieve a shared purpose? And the answer is yes. There's a historical case study of massive wealth hoarding through a neoliberal agenda that spans the last 70 years. Now, the question is, can we as seven and a half billion people growing daily, set ourselves on a collective journey to a future that we actually want? A future that does not involve the unraveling of the Earth's biosphere and actually enables shared prosperity for the majority of people and basic conditions of, of health and well-being. And the jury is still out on that question. But that is a task before us. That is a task that we need to take very seriously, daunting though it may be. So if you ask how does cooperation work, uh, most of you or maybe all of you have been in the previous talks in this series and been getting heavy doses of cultural evolution, you'll know that that's a question for cultural evolution researchers. That people who study how groups of human beings or fish or dolphins or crustaceans, various other animals that involve some kind of social learning or aspects of culture, how do they cooperate? That's a question that is being thoroughly studied through agent-based modeling. It's being explored through ethnographic studies by anthropologists. It's being looked at in public health settings and the study of policymaking and governance. So this is something that is being thoroughly studied in many different fields at the moment. And there are a lot of good answers to this question. But instead of telling you how cooperation works, I want to just let you know that that is a challenge for the field of cultural evolution to address. Because we have a lot of other challenges that we need to deal with as well. Now cultural evolution research, as I've been learning about it in the last few years and really mapping out the entire field of what is in this field of research, what kinds of questions does it let us answer? It helps us understand deep theoretical things like how did language evolve in the ancestry of the human evolutionary journey. It lets us understand things like how did uh, social organization of any kind emerge, including prokaryote to eukaryote cells or single cell to multi-celled organisms. But it also lets us answer questions that are very relevant to the big problems in the world today, such as some of the ones that I've listed up here. How does innovation work? What is innovation? Or interestingly, when are we actually doing imitation and replication of ideas rather than innovation? And maybe innovation isn't what we should be doing in the first place. Now, there's a large body of research in the diffusion of social practices and ideas. There's a large body of research in how social organization and complexity emerges and what happens when different levels of complexity arise. And that all of these things are studies in the evolution of cultural systems. So if we want to guide changes in cultural systems to be able to address big global problems, these are the sorts of things we need to know. So just to pause for a moment. Right now it's February of 2018. We're at a point where we're within a few decades of being beyond a threshold of, of runaway catastrophic climate change. We're in a time where our political systems around the world, many of them, are increasingly becoming crippled and dysfunctional. The US is not the only circus show in town, although it's probably the most entertaining one at the moment. <clears throat> but also, we're having a time of the most rapid development of aggregated knowledge that we've ever achieved. We're making advances in literally hundreds and maybe even thousands of fields of study. And we are developing capacities for managing complexity that are well beyond anything that our species was capable of doing before. I share this because the idea that we have to deal with global challenges that are so big and daunting may seem completely overwhelming. But what we have is this real convergence of crisis and opportunity. That just at the time when we need it most, all of the pieces are coming into play. So for example, worldwide, there are more than a million PhDs that are issued every single year. So how much aggregate knowledge is being produced in the world? What I've been observing as I've been spanning my way and meandering across hundreds of fields, dabbling here and there, picking up pieces, is that every major problem that I find when I go looking for answers, I find that the solutions exist in partial or complete form for every single one of them. So it's not like we're starting from scratch to deal with these problems. We are well on our way to solving them. The problem is we're not doing it fast enough. So 
What is it that enabled us as human beings to create such a monumental footprint on the entire planet? I'm going to offer one answer to this question. Consider this. What if behavioral flexibility is the root cause of ecological problems? <coughs> what if it is our ability to change our behaviors and modify them as an organism, as a biological being, that made this pathway to planetary disruption possibly even inevitable? So really briefly, behavioral flexibility, I'm really just thinking of basic things like a rock. It can kind of do what physics lets it do if someone acts on it, but it's not going to change its behavior on its own. Whereas plants have a limited kind of behavioral flexibility where they can do things like grow in the direction of light. And if you change the light source, they grow in another direction. And so they can have behavioral responses, but they're kind of limited. Whereas by the time you get to more complex organisms like mammals, we can have quite complex behavioral responses and that we can engage in social learning and actually have unprogrammed responses. So they're not instinctual, but they're actually quite flexible. And what we learn early in life enables us to do things later in life. What's interesting about the human condition is how we do this on steroids with jetpacks to the moon. How not only do we have behavioral flexibility, but we have created something that goes way beyond the behavioral flexibility of any other species. Now just to tell that story in brief, you think of it kind of like this. If you go back a couple million years to our ancestors that were starting to carve rocks and use them as basic tools, and then eventually they figured out how to harness fire and to do cooking, that gradually they introduced a set of feedbacks between social learning between each other, the development and use of technologies, changes in their behaviors that enabled them to start to alter their biology, so that eventually they could increase their capacities for social learning, for technology, and the cycle continued until we started to have these incredibly complex social dynamics. And these social dynamics enabled us to move from one niche to another and spread out around the world. So something about the human animal and its ancestors across the last few million years has gradually created this organism of incredible behavioral flexibility. And that story is becoming much more clear now in the last few decades, and especially in the last 10 years, where we actually have a pretty good understanding of how that came to be. But the important thing for our purposes is that the more behavioral flexibility we have as a species, the more environments we can adapt ourselves to using culture. And this is a key aspect of our spread around the world. So we think of this as like a brief sweep of time. You could say that there was a long period of time when we didn't live in permanent settlements and we lived in small bands, hunter-gatherers, or maybe pastoral or nomadic groups. And eventually, in a few places in the world, around the same time, at the end of the last ice age, agriculture formed, and they began to establish settlements. And in those settlements, they began to grow their populations, which increased the complexity of those communities. And then they began to migrate and dominate and conquer spaces around them and either incorporate the people living in them or displace them through warfare. And this allowed the population to continue to grow and the complexity of the social systems to continue to increase. And all the while there was this explosion of behavioral flexibility with the development of new technologies and as we moved into new landscapes. If you think about this as a thermodynamic process, if you put on your complexity scientist hat for a moment, what does this process tell us? It tells us that there was a time when there was a complex biosphere of the Earth, and there were relatively simple social organization for a small population of hominids. And then eventually, over time, those hominids started to transform their environments, internalize the energy and resources from them, and build their own social complexity. And because of the second law of thermodynamics, this caused entropy to increase. One version of entropy increasing is the degradation of environmental systems or landscapes like several of the major civilizations of history, collapsed because they degraded their soils or salts built up too much. And so they ended up having problems with the ability to maintain their populations as they were. So what was basically happening was a process of entropy increasing, where eventually the complexity of the society collapsed 
through a, si uh, a series of different proximate mechanisms depending on the context, but the ultimate cause in every case was the second law of thermodynamics. That as the entropy increased, offloaded onto the environment, the internal complexity of the society was not able to maintain itself, and some trigger event or set of trigger events caused its collapse. What had never happened before was for this to become planetary in scale. What's happened in roughly the last 100 years is our cultural success as a species enabled us to take this territorial expansion model that grew out of the agrarian societies and move it to the planetary scale. The way I like to say this in video game language is that we are now at the end of the age of empires. We've been having empires for something like 10,000 years in various places at various levels of sophistication, all of them playing for the end game of global conquest, and that game is now over. What happened in the last 100 years was we got the right mix of technology and cultural aspects that enabled us as a species, after 500 years of attempts at gradually building up globalized supply chains, to have this phenomenon of reaching planetary limits. And so now if you look at various different resource imports, inputs into our global system, things like fresh water, aluminum for manufacturing, and things like this, see that many of them, we've either hit the peak, passed the peak, or we're approaching the peak. And peak oil is one of those things that we're kind of right in the midst of. We have land use, we've degraded half of the world's topsoils, so we're in the process of taking away the, the productivity of the land masses of the planet. So this idea that we are this really successful species and so we should be optimistic about ourselves is a story with a double edge. Because the double edge is entropy. And entropy being an ironclad law of physics is something that's not easily overcome. So we're now at a time where the model of development that has become the, the go-to model of economic development supported by places like the World Bank and the United Nations, one of growing GDP to solve problems, is a, an approach that is ignorant of the most basic principles in physics. Which is a really disturbing thought that a lot of really intelligent people don't seem to get this. So I don't know if you all know about this, this framework here. This is the Planetary Boundaries Framework from the Stockholm Resilience Center. It's a group of Earth scientists, Earth system scientists. They try to ask a really interesting question, which is, what are the environmental variables on a planetary scale that beyond some threshold, that we may or may not know what it is, if we cross that threshold, a planetary scale civilization becomes unviable. They identified nine of these and they called them planetary boundaries. And what they determined with uncertainties in some of them, actually uncertainties in quite a few of them, is that it's pretty likely we've crossed four of them. Nitrogen composition in the nitrogen cycles being the one that we've definitely crossed. CO2 levels is another ocean acidification is another, and so on. The idea being that every one of these things is coupled in practice, but they're separate measurables. And so you can think of them as, if the planet has a homeostasis that includes a global human civilization, this is the boundary of operations for us. And while this is ongoing work and they haven't really figured out what all those thresholds are, or even if they will be a single threshold versus some cascade dynamic, is that there are definitely things that we should be looking for as we try to design for planetary scale sustainability. So, if behavioral flexibility is the root of our ecological crisis, it's also the only way out of it. The only way we get out of this crisis is to find ways to change our behavior intentionally, purposefully, collectively, toward goals that we can agree upon. And that means that we have to have ways of harnessing and guiding our cultural evolutionary process. And that's something that 50 years ago would have been the boogeyman of social Darwinism. But that's really a misplaced statement made about someone else's thinking that wasn't Charles Darwin. That was applied to something like Nazism in World War II. And we can't be afraid of this boogeyman because the boogeyman now is us. Humans are the cause of this crisis. So our task is to understand how we get ourselves into this mess and what we need to do to get out of it. And if it was cultural evolution, if it was the feedback processes of biology, culture,
technology, et cetera, those things coming together to create the situation, then it's only by understanding how those things work that we'll get out of it. So, how did humans become this powerful force in the world? How did it actually happen? And I'm going to give a really brief sketch, just in case some of you aren't familiar with this story. Because it's really interesting, and it gives insights into what the mechanisms are that we can now use and put into practice. The first thing is to start by putting on my cognitive linguistics hat, because I like to wear that hat sometimes. But about three million years ago, humans achieved this really beautiful thing, the first artifacts giving evidence that we had conceptual metaphors. We could look at a stone and in it see a tool and then begin to shape it to become that tool with this ability to do what's called conceptual blending, or we could have more than one concept, put them together into a gestalt within our cognitive, uh, cognitive architecture. And the first examples of this are the older one tools. What they tell us are a couple of things. One is that at least three million years ago, our ancestors had some pretty cool conceptual abilities. And while we may not have been the only animal around at the time that had them, we definitely have them at least that far back. But there's another thing to be learned from looking at tools like these, which is that we don't create these on our own. That we actually create them by teaching each other. They've actually been a really clever set of experiments where they've had people practice chipping off flakes from one of these tools with a simple chisel and having other people have different ways of learning it to see how social learning works. And what they found was that it's really hard to figure out how to make one of these stone tools without someone else there being your teacher and guiding you through it through a mentorship process. We, see, can, we can say the same thing for more complex things like building the tools to start fires, especially something as complex as this kind of a, a tool that came much, much later. So what this means is that for us to become the really powerful culture-changing and planet-changing animal that we are, it's because we are deeply social. But we're deeply social in some really interesting and in some ways unique uh, expressions. One of them being that we actually take the time to teach each other things. It's an interesting observation in animal behavior studies that there's very little teaching that goes on. Even with chimpanzees and bonobos and macaques, like when they learn things from each other, it's usually one of them's doing something and the other one's kind of watching them and trying to emulate it. But it's a big difference between having a tool that you're using because you see someone but you're not quite sure what they're doing and someone else pointing and saying, no, this, and then they show you. They've shown that these really simple forms of directed learning have profound differences in increasing the transmission of knowledge from one person to another. So this basic capacity to take information from one person's mind and body and transfer it into the mind and body of another person involves high fidelity transmission. And high fidelity transmission is not something that happens without teaching being part of the mix. So there's an interesting question about what causes the motivation for that. What were the unique conditions for the ancestors that we have that gave us this, this legacy of teaching and learning from each other? And some of that is lost. It's not in the fossil record, so we have to try to infer it. But it's a really interesting thing to think that the way we became this powerful animal that has shaped the world is because we take the time to help each other learn things. I, I find that really inspiring. I think that in today's world where we have so much division and so much to be fearful about, so much to worry about, there's something deeply reassuring that as humans, for millions of years, even before we were homo sapiens, we were the kind of animal that helps each other. And that says something about the possibility of dealing with the global crisis that we're in right now. Now, there's another interesting thing that happens when you look at this feedback between creating tools and using those tools to do things is that we have this thing called gene culture coevolution, which basically is that as we start to change our social environments, we change the selection criteria for fitness, which alters things like our sociality and our cognition. And so that we gradually develop things like proto languages. Or, in another interesting example, the one that I find most interesting to ponder is the story of the human gut. It's very interesting that for you know, two million years, we've been 
harnessing fire and cooking things. And what happens when you cook things? You make them easier to eat, easier to swallow and chew up, easier to digest. Even those stone tools from three million years ago, they would help with masticating things so our teeth didn't have to do it. So we were taking digestion and putting it outside of our bodies. Well, now let's go back to thermodynamics for a moment. What are the big energy hogs of the body? Two big ones. Brains are huge energy hogs, and guts are big energy hogs. So if you can do anything to reduce the requirement for the energy to process the cognition or the digestion of the body, the body is going to do it. <coughs> so what happened when we started creating fire and developing tools for masticating things? is gradually the selection pressure for keeping large guts was relaxed and the gut shrank. That's why I have this picture here of the gorilla skeleton versus the human in a scale to each other, is that one of our distant cousins that we have a lot of other anatomical commonalities with, we do not share the size of the gut cavity. That we were able millions of years ago to start to change our biology using technology and culture. And these feedbacks between technology, culture, and biology have the name gene culture coevolution. But what's really powerful is that we're forming niches in a way that is different from any other animal. So if you look at a beaver and how they form their dam and it changes a river, or you look at termites and how they form a mound and inside the mound they can maintain the temperature, they're creating a niche for themselves. Spiders do it with webs. There are lots of animals that create niches. But what humans do is we create social, cognitive, technological niches. And when we create social, cognitive, technological niches, we can do really bizarre things, like have French philosophers named Rene Descartes come and tell us that the mind is separate from the body. And we can build philosophies of political and economic systems that presume humans are not part of nature. So this idea that we create these really bizarre niches or to put it in the language of the Aborigines that we're dreamwalkers. We live in dream worlds. Our dream worlds are our cognitive constructs as perception conception systems for making sense of the world. I don't just see a bunch of objects in my landscape, I see meaningful objects. People with faces and intentions. Some of them people I know that I can think things about, like memories of them or things I know that they like. So, so we have these abilities to live in these dream worlds that can cause us to feel a perceptual separation from the natural world, which is a key part of how we got, into, got ourselves into this predicament. But the important thing for us is that more than any other animal, we have created the conditions for culture to shape our evolution more than the other inherited systems that animals experience, or not just animals, but plants and uh, protozoa and so on. Basically, we are the cultural evolution animal. And there's even an interesting discovery that cultural evolution happens so quickly that for humans it has now come to overwhelm the signal of genetic evolution. Genetic evolution continues for hominids and for homo sapiens. Evolution is still happening to us. But the evolution via culture is happening at much, much faster rates. Some estimates are as high as 10,000 times the rate of genetic evolution. And we can see this in population genetics when we look at um, genetic changes that are due to cultural factors like pigmentation of skin, eye color, lactose tolerance, things that are connected to cultural systems. Whereas people were able to go to higher latitudes, they could live with less pigmentation in their skins. And you can look, most of those changes happened in the last 10,000 years. That's pretty fast genetic evolution, but it was driven by cultural evolution. So even our genetic changes are increasingly being hijacked or influenced and driven by cultural processes. Which is another one of those interesting findings that helps to liberate us as humans to say we have tremendous freedom to set the course for the future by shaping the evolution of our cultural systems. And this isn't that Ray Kurzweil idea of I'm gonna upload myself to a computer and leave this body behind and evolution will continue and silicate. As beautiful as that idea is, it helped if we read a little bit of embodiment philosophy. But what I'm talking about is something fundamentally different here, which is that we can actually shape our future world because we live in imagined worlds anyway. But we have to know how those imagined worlds work. We have to know how we create them. 
and we have to know how changing them affects them. If we have an intervention, what does it do? So this idea that cultural evolution happens really quickly can be measured in some interesting ways. I really like this map, which is hard for you to read, but this is the number of distinct phonemes. And what you can see is that over the last 10,000 years, roughly, we have spread languages across the entire planet as humans have migrated. Can you think of any other organism that is spread with that much efficacy? Any that you do, like cockroaches or brown mice or, ra or brown rats, are because they hijacked humans. They came along with us. You know, brown rats live in pretty much every permanent human settlement on Earth. Uh, they followed us. So there are some organisms that follow our niches and live just fine in them. But what's interesting is that we're the ones who lead the way. And we've wrought havoc and destruction this whole way. There's now you know, really strong evidence that most of the time that there were big game animals in an environment and they went extinct shortly after humans arrived. It turns out it wasn't just coincidence. It turns out that they did disappear down that tiny little black hole roughly between the nose and mouth of the human. That we ate them to death. Uh, or we displaced them by changing their environments. So we have been causing environmental changes for a very long time. And not only on thousands of years, but you can look on the time scale. This is really hard to read. Uh, but on the time scale of even days, weeks, months, and years, this is a map of evolutionary influences, like a phylogenetic tree of location and source of music genre, where you can see someone picks up some jungle music, connects it to something else, and it becomes jazz. And so this idea that we're constantly remixing culture at incredibly fast pace is the normal now. It's just what happens all the time. If you go on YouTube tomorrow, you'll find different kinds of remixes than you found yesterday. So we're now in a time of tremendously accelerated and continuing to speed up cultural change. And when you add to this that we do something else that's distinct to humans, which is that we're able to accumulate on top of what we did before, that because of the fidelity of our cultural transmission and our increasing skill at social learning and teaching, we're able to create learning structures like pedagogy or metacognitive tools <coughs> that enable us to do things like refine and improve our designs. So if you take an automobile line like this one, you can see that as we make improvements in manufacturing processes, and as you come to discover flaws or weaknesses in your design, like we released this car, but it had a problem with the safety belt, and now we're gonna make a change to it, that we're able to build upon and refine and improve. And this process of technology innovation <coughs> is really just a process of cultural accumulation. And this allows cultural changes to happen very, very quickly. Because they can start out slow, and then gradually speed up, and then become extremely fast. And that's why it's possible for us to do things like this. A city in China that over a period of 30 years can completely transform its landscape by what it looks like looking at satellite images from space. Or within a span of roughly a century, we can cause so much heating of the Earth's atmosphere that you can watch the recession of entire ice sheets in multiple parts of the world. Or here where we can see economic patterns where the adoption of different technologies go from non-existent to ubiquitous in the span of years to decades. And right now we have one of those happening with the automobile where people in China all want to drive their own cars, which is not necessarily a rep uh, a recipe for the future that we're looking for. So, a deep implication of gene culture coevolution, a real disturbing one, is that this gene culture coevolution process is so powerful, it may shorten the lifespan of the biosphere of this planet. In extreme cases, if we have all out nuclear war, we have runaway global warming to get a greenhouse effect, we could actually kill the planet's biosphere. Now, while that remains unlikely, and we're not even that likely to drive ourselves extinct at this point in time, we're just threatening the efficacy of our global civilization, we are on a path where that is a possibility. And when I talk to gene culture coevolution researchers, I don't see this being on their radar. That the threat here is not just wiping out humanity, because that's not what we're doing right now. Remember that first graph? What we're doing right now is wiping out biodiversity. We're taking everything else out. Now to put this in a different way of thinking, 
if we were to ask, what was the thing that drove huge innovation and progress toward shared goals in the 20th century? It was this, the scariest image of the 20th century. An image charred onto the minds of millions of people. What if anyone drops another bomb on a city? This idea galvanized and scared so many people help drive economic interdependence between countries in ways that it would be really difficult to unravel. So if something that powerful drove us from there to here, then what do we do with this century's memory? What if we create a world where there are only a few species can? If you understand even basic ecology, there's this really powerful insight that there's a network structure within an ecosystem. The network structure has a hierarchical uh, uh, structure of modularity. There are multiple feedbacks across multiple layers. When you unravel enough of that network structure, you hit a threshold and the whole thing unravels. And the time that it takes to unravel the ecosystem is very short. The time to grow a replacement ecosystem of similar complexity is very long. In electromagnetics, that's called hysteresis, an irreversible process where once you go in one direction, you can't easily go back without doing a lot of work. It is a lot of work to build an ecosystem. So our nightmare that we're dealing with is the unraveling of our biosphere. And while global warming <coughs> is the catchphrase for it, it's about a hell of a lot more than carbon dioxide. So, what can we do about this? What is it possible for us to do? And this is where the work that my colleagues and I are doing I think is really important, which is what if we treat every location on Earth where social change is happening as a field site where cultural evolution research can be done? Well, you know, field sites are really powerful in archaeology, or they'll have some settlement that they're uncovering that's buried under the ground, or in biology, where they'll go to a place where there's a certain species that they're studying. In anthropology, where they'll keep going back to the same place to study changes in the culture. We have established models of field research sites. But as I've gone around working with social change practitioners in the last 10 years, I keep finding that there's this really disturbing gap between what is being learned about social change by scientists who study it and what is being done to create social change by practitioners trying to drive it. And so the people who are in cities trying to create resilient food systems, or in communities trying to reduce inequality or end domestic violence or address homelessness. There are people working on all manner of social problems trying to make their communities better. But by and large, they're flying blind because they don't know how to study the complex dynamics of social evolution. But if we set up field sites with researchers who know how to study it, to study those places, then we're researching the very places where people are trying to create change, which opens a possibility of a feedback loop, where the people who are trying to create change can learn from the people studying change to learn how to guide change, because they see the changes and get understandings of how the change works. And this is something that I think could be a really powerful way of creating a system of social learning for us to collectively guide our evolution toward desired goals. So this is the basic model. And this, graph's really, or this uh, slide is really busy, so I'll just walk through it. Imagine that there's a city that you want to create as a living city, meaning this city fits all the criteria of living systems, biomimicry through and through. So it's not just that it has renewable energy and solar panels and things like that, but also that its, its circulatory system is set up so that it's got the fractal efficiencies that nature naturally evolves toward in self-organizing systems and various other things. To get to a place where we have cities that are fully in harmony with their natural environments, we have to create something that's never been created before. It's never happened. No city in the history of cities has done this. So we have to figure out how to do it, and that means that we need to do research and evaluation on what's happening in the cities. We have to set up monitoring systems, just like you would do for environmental monitoring. So if you're gonna study a watershed, you're gonna set up a monitoring system for stream flows and the slopes of the rivers as erosion's happening and various kinds of things. So you have to be monitoring the social system and gathering the right kind of data. But you have to have goals. What are we doing this for? 
to ways of measuring the health and well-being of people so that they're fit for the future, so that the world that they're moving into is a better world by agreed upon metrics. And these can be things like uh, nutrition levels, educational attainment for students. Um, it can be safe nurturing environments for children, prenatal and postnatal care, things that could be generally agreed upon by a majority of people in a community. But to have those goals met, we have to create several things. One is we have to create a framework of participatory design. And this is specifically that when you're changing a watershed, you're changing physical matter using gravity. When you're changing a city, you're changing a social system and the participants within it. There are a whole bunch of ethical problems that come up when you do that. So the only way to do it ethically is to do it in a way that the participants know what's happening to them, and they're empowered to be agents of change themselves. And this is called participatory design, where you design for the participation of the user. If you want to use user-centered or user-experienced design, you think in the same way. Except instead of doing the design for them, you do the design with them. So people in their communities want to make their communities more walkable. How can they help that happen? They can do it through civic engagement, but they might do pea patch community garden projects or various other things. So they are co-creators of their changing landscape. And this is the way that you begin to address all of the ethical thorny issues that are definitely going to come up when you do this. But that means it's not just research for research's sake, it's action research. Action research has a particular feedback dynamic to it which is that you understand the system by affecting the system. In physics or engineering, we call this perturbation approaches. You perturb the system and watch how it behaves, and that's how you learn how it behaves. Except here, you're having it behave toward a goal. If there is complexity within a system and you don't know how the system works, you have to start to change the system in little ways to start to see how the system behaves. And so you're taking action on the system, but creating a research process to study the system as you do it so that the change process is the research agenda. And the idea of the practitioner and the researcher becomes integrated into a learning system. But that means you have to have communities of practice of various kinds. You have to have facilitators, researchers, students and educators. You have to have community practitioners, civil society organizations, legislators, policy makers, various kinds of people within the community that are doing this. But for this model, as complex as it is to work, it can't just be done in one place. You have to create a global network of these places so that you can learn what works in one place but doesn't work in another. What is generalizable and that can be standardized? What is ecological and contextual to a given landscape and a given culture? So you need to set up a variety of locations and have a learning process across them. What did we learn in one that might apply to another? So with this model of having field sites for cultural evolution research at large scales, you begin to see things like you can't create a sustainable city without creating a sustainable bioregion. And you can't create a sustainable bioregion without maintaining planetary stability. Because the weather patterns of the planet will just come and shift your biosphere anyway. And so you begin to see that there's a nested hierarchy that actually ratchets up to the global scale. And that anything <coughs> attempted globally will only be done because we're implementing it in multiple places at local scales, in parallel with each other. It's the only path. It's the only way to get to global resilience, is to have bioregional and local resilience, and a nested hierarchy of, of feedbacks and interactions. So another way of saying this is that this is everything from eco-villages to megacities. So when we're doing this process, we're not just saying, well, we're going to go into a city like Cape Town because they have 30 days until they turn off the water currently what's happening there. We definitely need to be doing this in Cape Town, but we need to be doing this in the thousands and thousands of intentional communities around the world, which have various levels of success at experimenting with different models of social organization. We need to be doing this with the increasing number of alternative currencies that people are creating in different financial systems, the entrepreneurial models for how to organize and create business, and how to mobilize and allocate resources, because there's not one solution. The solution is a process of creating learning processes. It's a process of creating learning processes. And then the solutions emerge through it. And if we do that, then we can see something really interesting. It begins to look like the entire planet is an organism. The entire planet begins to operate like an organism. 
the organism properties of the planet are its natural dynamics, like its geochemical cycles, and its cultural, technical, technological, economic dynamics, which is the humans maintaining it as a planetary stewardship. That we maintain it within the operating range for homeostasis of the planet. Doesn't get too much CO2 in the atmosphere, the oceans don't get too acidic, not too much nitrogen running off from our rivers, etc. And the only way that we do that is by creating a global meshwork of these kinds of local efforts. But because this is an evolutionary process, there's a statistical aspect to it, which is that at any given time, some of these experiments are going to succeed and others are going to fail. As our planet goes through this accelerating change process, many of the cities and towns that exist today are going to go away and disappear. Current estimates are that 80% of cities and towns within the Western United States that have less than 50,000 people are going to go away in this century, simply because the groundwater supply is going away. And so we have these problems where many places are going to be disrupted into non-existence. So what we have to look at is, if we think of this as a, like a Darwinian evolution process, there's a selective fitness, some things don't make it to the next round and other things do. What we need to be sure is that we have resilience at the network level. That we have a resilient planetary network of locations that figured out how to do it. And that's the only way that I can think of for us to maintain planetary social complexity through the changes that are happening. So all of this is built, it really works if it has solid foundations. And as a shorthand, I found that in terms of intellectual domains, this work depends on three intellectual pillars. That if you bring together the best of what's known about cultural evolution, now cultural evolution works, with the best of what's known about complex systems and how to study their dynamic patterns, phase transitions and things like that, and then we start with this grounded notion of embodied cognition because it lets us get away from all the dualisms and see the contextualization of behavior. It gives us a philosophical framework for understanding the human condition. When we put those three things together, that this becomes a viable research and action agenda. But it has a couple more elements. One of them is that it needs to be bioregional, local, and contextual, so there are gonna be various ways it's expressed in each place that it's gotta be networked and collaborative and be an open network with trust and integrity for sharing information across the system. This is where you can get into things like blockchain technology and what can those things do to help us with this. So if you think of the cutting edge technologies playing a role in this, they definitely have their place. Oops. Um, you also have to have it be anticipatory, adaptive, and learning. We need to create complex adaptive systems that are biomimicry and active. Because we can't be the change in the future when the, when the changes are sometimes unexpected. We have to be anticipatory of the things we can see coming. But we have to be able to adapt when things change unexpected. And if we don't do that, then it's not going to work. And then the last one is it has to be global, targeted, and capable. It has to be able to achieve global goals. It has to be targeted toward them so the local efforts can scale up to the global. And it has to be able to follow through to completion. If it's not able to do these things, then it's going to be a failed effort. But for all the people in 1960, when JFK said, by the end of this decade, let's get a man on the moon, and had this great moonshot moment, this is our moonshot. We have more than 10 years, but it's a hell of a lot harder than putting a man on the moon. We're trying to keep men on the earth and women. And so we are in a time where we're doing something much harder, but is more urgently needed than dealing with a Cold War crisis that may or may not have led to an arms escalation and, and dropping the bombs. We're already dropping the bombs. The bombs are us. So this is what we have to do. So the vision is to create a global network of these culture design labs where we research and design changes in culture. And in every place that we do this, we learn things. And as across the network, we learn a lot of things. So that we have a global collaboration that lets us find the solutions, find our way forward as we go about these changes. And so how do we know this can be done? I'll go through these pretty quickly. First is that we have lots of examples of applied cultural evolution being done at large scales, even though it's not normally called that. One of them is we have actually several hundred years of success in public health. 
creating sanitation systems and waste removal systems and getting people to wash their hands and creating medical systems that deploy and deliver upon people's needs. So we have a variety of ways that we have made our communities healthier through intentional design of policies, technologies, and science. And so this is a huge scale of successful applied cultural evolution that goes back hundreds of years. We've also been doing it in education. When you think about the rise of literacy in the last hundred years, the establishment of school systems around the world, the incredible capacity of university systems to create the advanced learning that we get in graduate school. That we have this amazing education system that was built up that changes the cultural transmission pathways of social systems at large scales. And this is something that, while we still have some flaws and definitely have challenges to deal with in getting education systems to work better, we've also got a lot of success coming behind us. So just to show that this is not something that's entirely new, we actually know a lot about applied cultural evolution. And this is a more, I don't know, good pros and cons one, but ever since Edward Bernays um, kind of set out to take his uncle's ideas and, Freud, and say, well, we can take people's base drives and use them to manipulate them to get our desires met as manipulators, marketing, advertising, public relations. This field, while it's not all unethical, there's definitely an unethical component to it, um, but this is an area where we've had tremendous success at changing people's behaviors. Simply look at the marketing budget that big companies use and ask, would they waste all that money if it wasn't effective? Marketing is an incredibly effective way to guide cultural evolution. And then there are things like urban planning, how we structure our environments that we live in. Well, we have tremendous power to, to alter the social niches that we form. And a great deal is now known about urban planning and urban design. So this is another area where we've made leaps and bounds for, in this case, thousands of years since the first cities to figure out how to design better communities that work for people. And so there's a huge opportunity to apply all of that knowledge as cultural evolutionary processes. What's interesting about all of these examples is they're mostly done without understanding the evolutionary principles involved. And this is an interesting thing in two ways. One is that the great beauty of evolution is it works without the organism knowing how it works. The other thing that's great about it is when we know how it works, it becomes a design science where we can guide it intentionally because we know how it works. And a great deal is now known about evolutionary processes and how they work. So if we begin to apply them, like the conversation we were having earlier about how social groups form and different scales of social organization for the size of the group, once you know these things, you apply it as design practices. By the way, that's called organizational management. So it's another area of applied cultural knowledge. So it's really fascinating to think, what can we do when we really know how these things work? And the last thing I'm going to kind of start to wrap up with is that in the last few years, as I helped set up the Cultural Evolution Society, we were mapping out the field of cultural evolution. And we did two exercises that were really interesting. One was, this graph isn't very visible because there were so many things on it. We surveyed our membership, actually about 500 of the members, asking them what other professional associations are they involved in. And we found that they were active in about 500 other professional societies spanning every major domain of the biological and social sciences. So our members were a slice of potential for knowledge integration across all of the biological and social sciences, which just shows the potential for the future of where this could go for changing universities. The other thing we did was we conducted a survey of the grand challenges of cultural evolution, where I actually did a linguistic analysis of the responses and created a network graph of the major themes and how they clustered. And what we found was that knowledge synthesis was the number one thing that the research community saw as needed for cultural evolution to take off itself. That it was too fragmented in the spirit, and people who did different parts of, the, of it didn't know about each other. So what this says is that we have the three blind men and the elephant. That we know a great deal more than we realize we know. And we just need to put it together. So our ability to apply cultural evolution is tremendous in the near future. And that's why we created the Center for Applied Cultural Evolution, which just launched last week. And our mission is to curate, integrate, and translate the best science available for change practitioners. But this requires getting the researchers to work together to create those research and monitoring systems so it changes the researchers, and build a global network of field sites so that we can get this mission toward planetary resilience underway. 
And we're not doing it for ourselves. It's a really important thing. That's what I'm doing. questions. So I just, uh, I have, I, have, I, have, I just, I don't know, I, I don't know if it's uh, the most appropriate thing to just start, it's like, like, it's a critique of what you said, but. <laughs> no, please. Okay. okay. Uh, so I, I just, I, I have, I have to take issue with the, with the, Barrier to change being lack of knowledge. I don't. I. I don't know if that's true, because uh, let's say I don't know. Would you look at a historical example? I know the Paris, the Paris Commune in 1871. Just uh, that didn't. That was a collaboration attempt, and that was that ended not because they didn't know how to design the city. But because the army marched on them and they killed all of them, right? Yeah. And that's that's not a, that's that's not something that they didn't know how to do, but that they're they opposed, and, and uh, they had an opposing interest that was more powerful than them. Yeah. And so I think that the, the problem with with the model that, that you present is that it, it lacks a political dimension. That that. Uh, People don't cooperate not because they don't want to. People are actually pretty good at cooperating, but there's proposing mechanisms for them to cooperate because I don't know. People at a, at a newspaper form a union and they get on fire, and that's yeah. I think that they, uh, that the order of the, of the media out there can do, and that's that's a, that's a barrier to cooperation that goes beyond them knowing how yeah. networks work or not, right? And and, and well, I think that's maybe a good place to stop. That uh, first of all, I'm not meaning to imply that it's only a knowledge barrier. Because I would actually say that what I present is a grand political challenge, and most of this work is political, actually, right? because it comes down to if there is a strategy for cooperation, then the strategy for cooperation becomes a strategy for upscaling the levels of cultural selection within the framework of multi-level selection. Theory. What I mean by that is that. If a small group of people is cooperating well, but another group is more powerful, that group is going to be able to out-cooperate them. So as they come in and kill them or defeat them in the next political competition or whatever it may be. But what is currently happening is there is a, an upwell of people trying to create large-scale change. So think of Arab Spring or Occupy Wall Street as, as recent failed attempts at this, where there are situations that a majority of people within the population want change, there's a political system that maintains the status quo arrangement of power. And one of the things that people in those environments uh, don't know, and I'm friends with several of the people who started Occupy Wall Street and some of the people in Arab Spring, is they don't know how to create the organi organizing capacities for large scale, or in some cases it's worse, that they actually have their own political ideology that's antithetical to organizing, that they're anarchists. And by being anarchists, they don't want any organization. So they basically, take away their capacity for a meaningful change by refusing to allow it on ideological grounds. The important thing here is that we have a limited time window where we either do this or we don't. And right now we're just giving it up to the elected officials within a gamed system of wealth hoarding. And that is a strategy for failure. That is definitely not going to work. And one of the things that most people who are trying to drive change don't know is how the political di dynamics actually work. And you can just see that in Democratic Party messaging, for example. A bunch of really idiotic strategies that are locked in, actually, for those of you who don't understand how that happens, there's actually a set of funders for the Democratic Party who want to be sure that pro-corporate ideas are always presented. So they select who the pollsters and the campaign directors are. And once you get to a certain level, they will not let you be in the Democratic Party until you use their messaging people to maintain the narrative. And that's why the Democratic Party is pissing up terrible at messaging. It's because there's a lock-in by a group of elites to maintain the power structure. And so people who don't understand that are not going to be able to change the Democratic Party, or better yet, replace the two-party system. And so those are processes of cultural evolution. And they are about, they're definitely about more than, than the knowledge to do it. But the knowledge to do it is a key piece. Are there other questions, comments?
Yeah, back here and then back here. Uh, what do you do about bad actors, right? So it's great to have this hyper cooperative, really safe, you know, universal way of you know handling this, but a couple bad actors and well, now it's all the line. What do you, what do you think? Well, I think there are two things. One is that there is an entire domain of expert practice, people who are group facilitators, who are really good at handling bad behaviors within a group. Think of the really skilled kindergarten teacher and the one kid who's acting out. A, a good kindergarten teacher will manage the group and give them activities. There are adult versions of that, but there are many different kinds of facilitation techniques. So there are ways of handling with good facilitation. But another thing is that there's a, a body of research in the evolution of trust. And actually, there's a really great evolution of trust game you can play that, uh, that Nikki Case put together. So if you could Google evolution of trust and Nikki Case, you'll find some amazing game. That shows how you can use agent-based modeling to explore different scenarios and strategies and how trust emerges or how it doesn't. And what those do is they give you design criteria for a collaboration. So uh, there are rigorous ways to study the breakdown or the emergence of cooperation at different scales. And that's going to be kind of between those two pieces, I think you can work out a lot of it. Yeah. So definitely like the idea of restructuring power structures, especially on the local scale, such that they scale up to a global uh, cooperative yeah. uh, systems. But uh, I'm a little bit sort of in the same boat as Pablo here, that there seems to be already organized systems in place to kind of dissuade that as much as possible. Um, do you think that that's something that has to be addressed directly, or is that something that's just going to fall to the wayside as we find out better ways to talk to each other and work together? Um, I think it's a little bit of the first and a little bit of a variation on the second, which is that it's going to collapse under its own weight. It's just going to take a lot of things with it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this really interesting process called lock-in, which is an economic development process, where you can think of technology lock-in, like when the VHS, which was the inferior technology, locked in the market. That it's, this is, has to do with cultural scaffolding processes, that an earlier stage of development within the cultural system creates uh, a self-organizing dynamic that increases the likelihood of one trajectory versus another. And we have a really powerful kind of lock-in right now with the fossil fuel in infrastructure. Where there are feedbacks to buying politicians, there's sunk costs in built environment, there's a whole set of things with know-how and engineering skill and its non-transferability, the non-mobility resources when they're locked into location and so on. And so one of the things that says is that if you think of that as a kind of inertia, then the system, just that, is going to have to be broken down and dismantled or collapse to get it out of the way. And that creates the openness of strategies like what happens when the next hurricane hits a place like Puerto Rico and destroys other infrastructure. They might choose to build differently. So there are things like that where there's infrastructure lock-in or socio-technological and infrastructure lock-in all fed together. And they're not going to be undone just on their own. But then there's the dark side, which is there are actually groups of people benefiting from the current system who are apparently very unscrupulous about you know, death and mayhem. And these are like the arms dealers and the sex traffickers and so on. These, these terrible people that exist in minorities but have formed clandestine networks together. And there the challenge is partly about um, ousting them and making them visible. And it's partly about sidestepping their system and using alternative systems in parallel that can be made resilient. This is like what alternative currencies do. And so the way I think about this is that there's a combination of strategies that need to be taken. It's not just one. One is that there is a, a built-in momentum for a collapse of this monumental consumer market system that is antithetical to sustainability. And it's going to run its course one way or the other. We want it to run its course faster, and we want it to get it out of the way. And then another thing is that there will be disasters of increasing intensity and frequency that will destroy infrastructure in different places, which creates opportunities to design differently. And a third thing is that there can be directed advocacy and political action efforts to undo the systems of clandestine corruption. And I think all of these things need to be done in conjunction with each other to give us the best prospects. And even then, it's. It's still like a moonshot. I think it's still slim prospects. It's going to be hard work. So I, I don't doubt the voraciousness of those people clinging to their power. Uh, just kind of going off of that, actually, um, you described in the beginning um, the possibility of doing something on a global scale uh, simply because we've already established neoliberal structures that do the same thing. Um, Naomi Klein talks about climate change in the same way. Um, I'm curious. 
Um, a lot of what you're talking about, this type of networking between laboratories and networking between scientists and researchers, um, is dependent on those neoliberal structures. And in order to sort of move those structures aside and have this revolutionary change take place that we're talking about, you wouldn't necessarily, uh, like you're saying, need those structures to collapse. Um, but would that prevent then the internet working that you need to take place? I, I think there are plenty of scenarios where it would, where it would make it undoable. And there are some scenarios where it would not. And we just don't know how likely those scenarios are, and they need to be developed and fleshed out and clarified. So one of the things that uh, struck me when I learned about the tax haven system was, let's say it's $20 trillion. If we were able to recapture 10% of that, that's $2 trillion. That's a huge amount of money. If that was deployed strategically with the existing investments in education and research and social welfare programs and such, it could be transformative and could change the game. But anyone who tries to do that needs to be really careful about avoiding assassination attempts and stuff like that. But we have had things like the release of the Panama Papers and some things that are increasingly radical in that sense of getting closer to the root. So we're closer and closer to recapturing some of those resources. And so there's a strategy of creating bridge funds by reclaiming funds that have been hoarded. And so I think there are scenarios to be played out and it's difficult to know what the likelihood is. But this is where, when I look at something like the US Department of Defense in the best light, because it's a real mixed bag, there are some of the best strategists in the world, some absolutely brilliant people. There are also some fantastic humanitarians in the US military. And you think of how would they think about something like this with all of their capabilities, that we need to be thinking at that level of sophistication. And the closest thing I've seen to that is the science fiction series uh, Demon and Freedom Trademark that Daniel Suarez wrote. If you haven't read, it's like a, a science fiction version of how this revolution could happen um, using off-the-shelf technologies at the time the book came out, I think in 2006 or 2007. Um, but plays out a scenario of gamifying the whole thing. And so it's interesting to play with, uh, with you, the use of fiction and storytelling to play out the scenarios as well. That's a whole other topic, of course. Other comments, questions? Yes. I guess I was wondering why, if this is a really pressing problem, given the, the history that you provided, that, that there's been this, there's been um, quick uh, cultural evolutionary change when people had a shared motivation to keep power in mind. It seemed like in that case, it was a shared idea or motivation that, that allowed for that quick change. It seems like cultural evolution would be much slower than something like psychological manipulation. <laughs> um, and so if we're gonna go for manipulation, why not do something fast, like get everybody on board with the same idea? Why go for something relatively slow in cultural evolution? Um, well, first of all, Either way, it's cultural evolution because in both cases, it's changing cultural transmission and cultural selection. So it's it's cultural it's cultural evolution in either of those situations because um, it's still changing the composition of the culture and using evolutionary processes. Maybe I could ask it to yeah. Why put your money into having cultural researchers? Why not put it into psychological researchers? Well, first of all, the divide between cultural researchers and psychological researchers is one of the problems. And just like anthropologists and sociologists and psychologists being separated is a problem. There are strengths to the different techniques and the different scales that people work on. But if you look at something like social psychology, there are these Venn diagrams of overlap that they could be a sociologist in some contexts, anthropologist in others, psychologist in others. And what, what I've seen is happening is roughly since the development of cybernetics and information theory, so say 70 years ago, there's been an increasing uh, adoption of systems thinking in various kinds in every field of scholarly work. And as we've moved in the direction of systems thinking, the um, disciplinary categories of the 20th century are increasingly porous in their membranes and overlapping in their, in their activities. So what's needed is to create knowledge synthesis across them so we have whole systems approaches. So it's less about it being one group of researchers in, in, versus another. It's more about creating the composition of research integration and practitioner integration that we can guide system changes. So it's more like that. That, that is really the thing that's missing. And so using the, the idea of, of how to motivate people on large scales, the thing that happened with the moonshot was the fear of the other guy doing it first. It was the US being afraid the Soviet Union was going to do it. <coughs> and it was part of an existential arms race that had been built up as a narrative. So it wasn't simply this is a thing we want to do. It was there is another, uh, an enemy that we're motivated against. 
problem with, with the global ecological crisis is if you click the check marks of every psychological bias that would make it easy to have rapid collective action, we hit none of those check marks. It's distant in time, it's obscure in causation, it's complex, it's non-personal, it doesn't have agency. You kind of go down the checklist of things that marketing would use to sell the idea, it doesn't hit any of them. So some people have called it the perfect psychological storm. So what we have to do is find ways to address this problem in spite of that deficit. So it's gonna be challenging to do. But one of the things that I think is really powerful and in the work I've done on the framing of, of global warming is that there's a, an ability to do a strategic reframe as a collection of stories. And it has to do with the story of what it means to be human. So the dominant story in the world right now is the story of rational action. The selfish, utility maximizing, homo economicus. And that story is invalidated by decades and decades of research, but it's still the dominant narrative culturally. And so we need to replace that narrative of the, narr the narrative of, of humans, whether it's homo socialis, homo ludens, there are various incarnations of it, homo ecologicus, whatever, you know, we don't need to use the Latin word for it. But there's a story of what it means to be human that is really powerful. And often I found the most powerful expressions of it are the stories of childbearing. You can see so much about what it means to be human by your extended childhood period, by how much nurturance is required, by how much codependency arises between parent and offspring, by how strong the emotional bonds are. There's a whole set of things that are just beautiful aspirational <coughs> qualities of being human. And right now, I think we need a really serious boost in our belief in ourselves. So that's part of it, but it's a big thorny problem. No doubt about it. So you, you showed early on that measure of what the, the 12 things or whatever that are needed to keep a society going or keep the planet going. At what point, if any, do you say it's going to fail? We, have al we already know this. We can't stop it anymore. And you shift gears to planning for what to do when it does or surviving past that point rather than trying to turn things around there. Well, there are two things I'd say about that. First, in my personal assessment, it's already too late. Just name that on the top So the second thing is this is what we need to do either way. We need as much biomimicry type of resilience as possible in whatever future world it is. So this is the path to take regardless. There's another thing to say, which is a caveat, that it's not like we're waiting for the collapse to happen. The collapse is already well on its way. The collapse of big game fishing in the world ocean was 99% done by the year 2000. Uh, so we, we've been deforesting the planet in a way that affected the climate for about 4,000 years. So you know we've already avoided the next ice age according to planetary dynamic theories. And so, so there are some aspects of, we've already set ourselves on a different course. The Anthropocene, they've kind of agreed formally that it was the first atomic bomb test in 1950, roughly. But they had many different measures they could have used. And the first one was agriculture. You know, they kind of used several. The key thing is that this is a, a multiple synchronous collapse dynamic with different time scales for different processes. Some form of collapse have already happened. Actually, the mass of wealth inequality is collapse of democratic institutions and market economies. They are collapsed by that measure. They're failed states by that measure. And so, so that's another thing is we can't be afraid of collapse because some of it's already happened, some of it's ongoing, some of it is inevitable to happen in the future. The key thing is to hold to what is sacred in us for the future that we want to give to the future. And, and, that's, and that's like, if we really care about humans being here, what do we do to give, a, to give future generations the best future that they can have? And then it's still the same strategy. So that's where I think it's like, we kind of have to do the dance of the devil on this one. It's like, it's just there because it's already 2018 and we're already this far along. In the first you know, climate uh, hearing in the US Congress is 1987. And so just recognizing that place in history. Yeah, I'll come back. Yeah. Following up with the dance with the devil, um, someone might look at your uh, inequity and wealth graph and say, wouldn't it be easier to change the psychology of 30 or now eight people than it would be to change billions and billions of people and how they interact? It's worth trying. Unfortunately, there's a self-selection dynamic that increases the composition of sociopaths and psychopaths in that group. People have no conscience. And so um, they just don't have that biology. So that's a challenge. They're not all that way, but some of them are. I don't think Bill Gates is. I think he may have Asperger's or something, but he doesn't strike me as a psychopath. 
Um, whereas some others, I would say definitely, no, it's like, well, we should have them tested. Um, but so, so just recognizing that. Um, another thing is that rather than going to those eight or the people who are at the top of the mountain who have the most to lose, it's better to go two or three levels down. Because it's amazing what could be done with the infusion of $10 million here or $10 million there by the kinds of people who have a few hundred million dollars. And so even better if it aligns with their investment portfolios for things like renewable energy. So I think that there is a strategy, and there are people already doing this. There's the Cirrus Investment Group that's doing a version of this, where they now have $2 trillion in assets around the renewable energy markets, where they're trying to mobilize this. And so I think there are a lot of things that can be done at a lower level than those pinnacle people. But we should be going for it. And there are folks like Warren Buffett is trying to do a version of it. So, um, so it's kind of like all strategies and tactics are on the table that are compatible with the outcomes we're trying to get. So we should definitely be going after it. Just recognizing eh, it may or may not work. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so what? What do you think is the advantage of this outlook against, for example, uh, I don't know, why is it better than being a socialist? Well, being a socialist is, first of all, a 19th century construction of a model of centralized governance where we now know mostly doesn't work. Whereas social, socialized welfare programs within democratic systems with market economies work really well. Hybrids of them. Like where? Like, like in the Scandinavian countries. That's not what it is. And so, well, there are, the thing is, these are systems that evolved from those models, and they're not the simple, simple caricatures of those models that came before. So, like, there are elements of Marxism in the social democracies of the Scandinavian countries, <coughs> just like there are elements of it in, you know, the, uh, the healthcare system that we have in the U.S., as bad as it is. But there are also market dynamics that have been brought in. And the problem with those, those systems, like talking about socialism versus um, capitalism is, first of all, neither of them are monolithic. There are many different kinds of socialism, there are many kinds of capitalism, there are many hybrid forms. So they end up being categories that are not particularly empirically useful when we look at diversity of cultural settings. The other thing is that there's a kind of socialism that is absolutely essential for this to work, which is that we have to create healthy, strong communities. And communitarianism and socialism in that sense is an essential component of this. So part of it is translating it's like the parts of socialism that are beneficial need to be brought in. So something, when, when um, one of my friends and I, Robert Kennard, we started Evenomics Magazine, which is an online magazine for complexity and evolutionary economics. And our, one of our first goals was to have the science speak first and ideology second, because so much of the economics discourse was, I'm gonna throw around my favorite dead economist or my favorite um, uh, straw man uh, economic ideology label. And then the conversation would be stopped at that point. So someone would say, oh, you're talking about this thing. You're a socialist. And it's like, all you did is throw a word at me. And what it meant was the, the advances that have been made in complexity and evolutionary economics are absolutely phenomenal. And there's a real understanding of the economic systems that's come about that validates some of those social theories and then validates others. And that's just called science, where we update our models. But when we use those social theories without putting them into that learning process of science, we fall into the old game of I throw my label at your label, which doesn't really help us. Well, just the, 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 the welfare programs in Scandinavia were won by the Scandinavian labor unions organized yeah, under the Scandinavian absolutely. socialist parties, as yeah. was the NHS in England. And that's, like, that's cultural multi-level selection. They created an organization at a large enough scale they could outcompete other groups, and they won. But so, yeah. why, why is this better than just forming a socialist party and winning all those things? because how you do it is exactly the cultural evolutionary process I'm talking about. So it's not about the ideology, it's about understanding the processes and the mechanisms. So that it's not just what we're trying to do, we have to know how to do it. And that's a big problem with change practitioners is they don't actually know how to do it. So the learning there is definitely needed. You have one more question. One more question. Anyone else who hasn't asked a question yet? Uh, so, uh, what is it? I think the, I uh, totally appreciate the input that uh, people that have gone through a lot of education, a lot of experience, and, you know, uh, developed a lot of knowledge their own, on their own. The amount that they can input into this process is, you know, we won't disagree that that's a lot, right? Uh, but at the same time, I've seen quite a bit. So I tried to do uh, not hydroponics, aquaponics, the fish and the plant yeah. systems. 
And in doing that, I discovered that there was a lot of talk about what worked in given spots with given properties and given capabilities or financial inputs. And so my question is, have you guys looked at those sort of networks as systems that you can piggyback off of for getting resiliency into definitely. Uh, communities? Definitely. Yes, them? definitely. One of the key areas, I think one of the most popular areas of cultural evolution research would be in the realm of cultural anthropology, looking at practices that work in different contexts. Because that's where you'll see things like this way of processing this plant takes out the toxins and then you can eat it. Those very practical things. And those accumulate in cultural systems over time. So there's a huge reservoir of that knowledge, although it's rapidly being lost due to globalization. So, so some new things like aquaponics are coming into being as kind of cutting edge knowledge areas, but others are like the aboriginals did this for thousands of years in the Australian continent, and, and so some of those sorts of things are being lost. So there's also a cultural heritage question. How do we not lose proven <coughs> practices that work in different and diverse cultures, which is something that didn't come up in this conversation, but should. And you can say aquaponics is like, part of the cultural heritage of who comes next that's been developed more recently. But that, that is, I think, the bread and butter of how to do it. Teaching people how to do it is saying, well, look, these things, they work, and this is why they work. And this is how you can use them here. So yeah, definitely. Cool. All right, so, yes. well, um, thanks. Let's thank uh, Joe <laughs>